I'm sorry. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. The um, I might say that I would rather have had a portion of the seventy-five million instead of the lecture series. <laughs> Never offered. Okay. Um, over the years, um, I've hosted uh, numerous presentations and um, and was the introducer to many of the people that, that made those presentations. Many of these uh, presentations occurred because during the period that I was on the administration of the Ohio Aerospace Institute in Cleveland, Ohio, the president at... Uh, at OAI, as we refer to it, uh, gave me the assignment that, Professor, I want a lecture every month forever. And I said, well, Mr. President, we'll need a little money to run that. He said, not a problem. And so he made it so that uh, we, had, we had sufficient uh, money. And so every month there was a lecture at OEI, and in the summertime, we had speakers, weekly speakers, that talked to the summer interns and summer faculty as well. So just a myriad of uh, talks were given. Just as an aside, during these talks, I would ask the speaker, would it be possible for you to come to Toledo and give that same talk? Uh, I don't know. They would say, I don't know. There was one fellow from Stanford, Bob McCormick, a very famous guy in CFD. And he said, OK, I'll come to Toledo, but I have one condition. And I could go around the room and ask you what you think that condition might be. And you'd never guess it. He said, I want you to buy me a Toledo Mud Hens T-shirt. <laughs> He wanted to wear that when he went back to Stanford. So I said, no problem. And I got him a T-shirt. And I, I could tell a story about us driving back to Cleveland, with, but I won't. I mean, that was, that was something else. He was not used to snow, wind, rain, hail, all of that. And we went through all of that. In any event, uh, I got to attend over the years. I got to attend some excellent presentations. And I met some really outstanding people. For example, I had the privilege of introducing astronaut John Young uh, to a packed auditorium filled with summer students, faculty, and NASA employees. So packed, in fact, every seat was taken, and the aisles, there were people sitting in the aisles as well. You know, and, and obviously, if uh, someone from the fire department came in, they would have closed down that place, and it was, it was really something. John Glenn, for your information, was a uh, Georgia Tech Aero grad, and he was the first commander of the space shuttle and one of the first men to walk on the moon. And, and that, that's what the enthusiasm was to, to see him. As another example, I provided the introductions to several historical presentations by John Anderson, who talked about the Wright brothers and early airplane pioneers. For your information, uh, Dr. Anderson is the curator of aerodynamics at the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in DC. And he's a professor emeritus in the Department of Aerospace at the University of Maryland. The last uh, illustration is uh, I provided the introduction to a Dr. Robert Greist, a member of the newly formed UT means society. Uh, and Robert Grace talked to a packed room full of summer visitors at NASA Glenn. As I recall, Dr. Grace, who teaches at uh, Pennsylvania, at University of Pennsylvania, talked about some of the troubled youth that he was tutoring in mathematics in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. And you could have heard a pin drop uh, uh, at his talk. 
Okay, uh, so after viewing many, many presentations, I concluded that good presentations were invariably based upon a very interesting story. A story which gets told by a very experienced and knowledgeable presenter. Today's presentation, Intelligent Transportation from Model T to Autonomous Vehicles, is really no different than that. The story begins with Henry Ford's Model T and carries us through and beyond our current time. Today's presenter is Dr. Mehdi Almanian, who comes to us from Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, uh, Virginia. And to say that he is very experienced and knowledgeable is a vast understatement. Dr. Almanian received his BS MS and PhDs in mechanical engineering from the State University, New York at Buffalo. He also obtained a MA degree in business administration from Penn State. He joined Virginia Tech as an assistant professor in 1995, and six years later, he had become a full professor. He is the director of the Center for Vehicle Systems and Safety and the director of the Railway, Railway Technology Laboratory. These laboratories have had a giant impact on Virginia Tech. Since joining uh, Virginia Tech in 95, his research has resulted in 123 funded projects, totaling more than 27 million. He's a fellow of the ASME, a fellow of the SAE, and an associate fellow of the AIAA. Dr. Ramanian has a long list of publications and has made nearly 400 presentations, including numerous keynotes, plenary, and invited lectures. Among the many awards he has uh, obtained, he is the recipient of the 2019 Magnus Hendrickson Innovative Award which is the seminal SAE International Award in Vehicle Dynamics and Suspension Technologies, and is the recipient of the 2023 Virginia Tech Alumni Award for Research Excellence. Oh, and by the way, in 2020, Dr. Romanian was appointed to the prestigious J. Bernard Jones Chair of Mechanical Engineering at Virginia Tech. You know, with, with any extremely um, uh, qualified individual, you can go on and on and explain so many more things. But rather than do that, I think I'll stop here and ask you to help me welcome what I would refer to as, a, uh, internationally, as an international expert in vehicle system dynamics and safety and a most respected researcher. And I believe that what we should have here is a very enjoyable lecture. Dr. Romani. Thank you so much, Dr. Keith, for that wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I am absolutely humbled and honored uh, to uh, be here. Uh, before I start my lecture, let me uh, pause for a second uh, and uh, give special thanks to Professor Lonya uh, for inviting me to be here. I would like to thank the selection committee uh, for uh, making the selection for me for this prestigious lecture. Uh, I would like to thank uh, A.D. Rose for doing a lot of the heavy lifting with making things happen. Uh, and uh, I also would like to uh, let you know that uh, just very recently, Dr. Lonya was inducted into the Vienna Tech Society of Distinguished Alumni. She's a very prestigious award. <laughs> with that said, I would like to start with a uh, bit of confession. When I was invited to give this talk, I like 
any self-respecting professor, went to my role of excellent presentation and started catching uh, bits and pieces from various ones that I had made in the past and uh, talked a little bit about what we did in this area, what we did in that area, what we did in that other area, uh, which are all the things that certainly as a researcher, I'm quite proud of because I, um, I have a lot of passion for them and, and certainly make a living out of them. Uh, and then as I was finished with that work and I wrote my abstract, I was able to remove myself from it and uh, kind of look from where you guys are sitting. And I say, you know, that's quite exciting and interesting to me because I'm doing it and I'm engrossed in it. And I'm not sure if the same could be said for people who have a solution. So we just say I kind of threw away, you know, threw away that abstract and I went back to the drawing board, as they say. And I uh, decided to give this lecture on something that I have been very passionate about, and that is the history of transportation. So I'd like to start from the very beginning. I would like to for us to walk through the history and talk about some of the things that has shaped our transportation industry. Uh, certainly of uh, our lives. Uh, and then uh, what has brought us to where we are today? And if you would allow me, I'll step back and perhaps project into the future as long as you promise not to hold me to it, right? Because uh, I, like many others, um, are walking on thin eyes when we project into the future because inevitably, we are not able to estimate everything, and inevitably, we are proven wrong. In other words, uh, the human being optimism uh, will carry us even further, right? Which is awesome, absolutely awesome. And you see, I care about communication because I believe that is something that has played a strong role in uh, us as human beings and our development. Uh, one can reflect back to the days that man sort of domain of roaming uh, was within a circle of maybe a few miles of where one lived. And of course now we're able to circle the globe in a, uh, a few hours and we are even making strides to reach outside of our immediate domain of living on Earth and out of that. If you think about it and reflect on where we were just maybe a few hundred years ago and how far we have come and where we are going to go, maybe if we come back in, I don't know, Years from now, yeah, then you will be able to better appreciate the gravity of how important transportation is and how it plays a role in our us as social beings and within our society. Now, certainly within the limited time that I have, I will not be able to share with you all of that in terms of um, where we have been and where we are going. Uh, but a small sliver of it, as it relates to our transportation um, within automobiles. And it kind of starts back in the eight later part of 19th century, uh, where Carl Benz invented the first automobile. And this was a simple concept, um, but yet quite revolutionary. Uh, it uh, was able to provide us mobility that was magnitudes beyond one was able to have. More importantly, <laughs> this horseless carriage, as it was called, did not rely on horses and that needed to be 
taking care of and fat and so on and so forth. And it was also an engineering feat in the sense that it had gained the power frame that was all human created. Long, not long after that, uh, Fernandine Ford came up with the first hybrid car and he showed it at the Paris Auto Show. This is 1900. And perhaps some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I thought that hybrid electric vehicles is the zoo thing and we just came up with it a few years ago, a decade or so. But that was certainly the second resurrection of hybrid <laughs> electric vehicles. What Porsche did at the turn of the 20th century was that he pretty much adopted what we have been and have been doing with our railroads and locomotives, where we would take uh, steam generated one way or another, and we'll turn it into electricity that propels our radio. To this day, again, as I said, that's what we do with locomotives. But what he did back then, he was able to package all of this and put it in a way that could be what he could package and use it. Sometimes I wonder if we are going to have vehicles in the future that do not need refueling. Some of you are thinking, well, how could that be possible? Well, think about it a little bit. The nuclear industry is all savage. We're able to make nuclear power, and we have it for many years. Now, why should I take the same, put it in the micro pack package, put it in my vehicle, that provides a certain need with long duration power, and after X number of years, when it has reached the end of its life, a lot of the data to recycle that vehicle with some of the data and will turn it uh, into a Recycle the nuclear aspects of it and give it a fresh life. And in a, in a way, I know what pushed it in the turn of the century. Not long after that, one of the critical things that we have, and sort of what I found is really interesting in the history of transportation in the sense that. Barry Anderson invented the first windshield wiper. She was intrigued by the fact that during her trip to New York City, the drivers had to reach outside of their windshield and clean the windshield. And um, she was very clever, innovative, and um, she came up with this concept where she invented uh, the windshield wiper based on the fact that she realized that well, the squeaky works pretty well in terms of uh, wiping that water. She um, put a handle on it and allowed the driver to operate the windshield wiper from within. Eliminating the need for getting wet while you're reaching outside the windshield to clean it, right? And um, and uh, of course, uh, she got patent on it. Uh, you see on the uh, on the slide, she reached out to auto industries and wanted to uh, sell her patents uh, for a product. And inevitably, they all came back to her and let her know that. No, her idea of the design of work, in fact, some of them told her that, uh, uh, that uh, it was dangerous because it was distracting the drivers. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, she 
had to have the last laugh because, uh, you know, you can't even imagine our vehicles uh, without a windshield wiper now, right? So um, that's an example of where someone is well ahead of their time, comes up with a brilliant idea, and, um, and then gets a uh, absolute rejection. You know, as I was reading her story, I must admit that I had to pause and think a little bit about how much this had to do with her as being a woman and well ahead of her time um, for her era. And how much of it was the fact that her idea did not resonate with uh, the industry. Right? And that's another example of how far we have come in our social thinking in general towards race, gender, and other matters. We're now we're able to look at an invention well beyond uh, its who whose it is or what kind of race or gender uh, or social circumstances the person comes from and well into that which certainly is quite welcome. Now, let me move on. Um, Rolls-Royce in, again, the same era, came up with um, what they call the best car in the world. And certainly for its time, it was quite advanced. This thing has six cylinders arranged in two rows, not quite a V6, but sort of two parallel threes, if you may. Um, it had a whopping 800 horsepower for its time, really advanced. It had a three-speed transmission, again, really advanced. And it had the early generation of spark. So Rolls-Royce was really emboldened in calling this the best vehicle ever because it did have a lot of wonderful technologies. And certainly, it paved the way for many that would follow. And perhaps by now, you're starting to sort of get the sense that as we went from one type of vehicle to the next, then our experience, our engineering ingenuity, and our creativeness kind of carried us to the next one. And speaking of the next one, Kettering, the founder of Delco, Dayton um, elect, uh, Engineering Laboratory Company, shortened for Delco, he came up with the automatic Start. Prior to that, and in fact, I remember this as a kid, that there were, and I didn't mean to age myself, I did. That was, that was not a very good example. Uh, that many vehicles had a handle skirt. There was a physical handle that you had to engage to turn the motor while the person behind the steering wheel would get the engine started, what you do, and then once you were finished, you remove that handle, stored it in the car, and went on the driving wheel. Well, this woman in Detroit was driving the car, and it was the middle of winter, and uh, the car installs, and it installs, and uh, she cannot restart the engine. This man um, who was the owner of a company uh, and, um, and a friend of Leland, and Leland at the time was the president of Cadillac. And um, this man, nice man, stops and offers help to this lady. Of course, old agent a lot of resistance, and the handle uh, kicks back, 
and hit him in the face, and um, he develops infections and dies from it. This affected Leland really, really profoundly because he had lost a good friend of his, and he reached out to Kettering, who is one of the giant names, uh, mind you, in uh, automotive history. Um, he started many companies, Delco included, and moved on and, um, and became the president of GM. And of course, the Kettering University is named after him. So uh, Kettering uh, went to work. And um, it just so happened that they had had uh, some projects that kind of could be related to an electric starter or automatic starter. And they were able to connect the pieces. And of course, Charles Kettering was uh, quite a brilliant engineer himself. And then voila, we ended up with this other invention that has played a pivotal role in, uh, in our automobiles. So um, quite fascinating. And then in 30s, we started, as our vehicles started going faster and faster, our Aerospace engineering friends said, well, you know, we got to be doing better. We got to make these cars more aerodynamic, right? So sort of like this new era was born. Up to now, I'm trying to add more horsepower. I'm trying to get myself from point A to point B faster. And then came this other area where it said, well, what can I do to make your car more aerodynamic? And they designed cars like this, uh, where notice that I've got a longer recline, I've got a more sleek exterior, and it, to this day, it lays the foundation for a lot of the aerodynamics that we have in our vehicles. And then around the same time, our friends in Europe, most notably, um, Andre Gustav Citroen, who had started his own company, they more or less took the same thing and they uh, made it a front wheel drive vehicle, the first of its kind for that generation. And again, Citroen to this, this day is a well-known name in Europe. And their vehicles are often associated with functional vehicles that are suitable for the younger and uh, the general masses in terms of uh, their popularity, in terms of uh, their cost factors, and so on and so forth. And then we have Another one of the icons in transportation industry, the Volkswagen Beetle. And this was kind of an interesting marriage of engineering and politics. The engineering side came from uh, Ferdinand Porsche, who by the way was a brilliant, brilliant engineer strong Nazi sympathizer, and Otto Hitler, who was intent on sort of making the rest of the world aware of the engineering uh, ingenuity of Germans. And uh, he had a direct hand in the development of this vehicle and its marketing and its um, its uh, really presence around the world, which to this day is endeared as one of the iconic vehicles that we have. And perhaps this was one of the first times where we had politics directly playing a role in engineering, certainly automotive engineering. And mind you that this is during the era that our air transportation was becoming 
more uh, developed, in particular on the military side. The Germans were running a little bit behind some other countries in the world, the British and the Americans, and so on and so forth. And uh, they certainly wanted to make sure that they are letting the rest of the world know that they're not too far behind. And that sort of played into the psyche of developing uh, the uh, beetle. Again, a novel concept for its generation. Um, it was a rear engine um, vehicle and it was air cooled. So that made it really suitable for military applications and such because you were not running on um, fluid cooling and all of the ill of these that they may have. And again, the same thing sort of played across the pond in the US. That the US military was interested in a light to medium tactical need. And uh, they had invited three companies to bid for this contract. And um, one of those three companies was Willys, um, which was a small company compared to some of the others that had been invited, like Ford and so on and so forth. And uh, they, Willys, it just so happened that they had a vehicle on the drawing board that um, they were marketing that for as a low price sporty vehicle for the youth. And then when this opportunity came along, they more or less took the same thing, repackaged it, and um, made it like what you see, like door, like very low door lines for the uh, for the uh, troops to get in and out and, and so on and so forth. And notice that this is called uh, the Willys Overland Quad or Willys Quad because it was one of the first four wheel drive vehicles of its kind. There are many stories of how this vehicle is able to uh, find its way through most treacherous fields even though it's larger counterparts and more powerful counterparts to get started. So it has lived as a legend, uh, both on the military side, and of course, it's one of the modern day vehicles that has perhaps the most loyal following of any vehicle. Many years ago, when I was in the industry, I was in my sort of 35 years ago. I was having a conversation with an engineer at Chrysler at the time those were manufacturing G. And he was sharing with me that we're doing everything possible to kill G because it has outlived its engineering era and what we could package in it and so on and And yet the market is not letting us do it. You guys keep buying and ask for more. And of course, someone put that story in, oriented it towards success that it is today. By the way, after a lot of testing and going back and forth, finally in 1941, um, Willie's Overland was, was um, or Willie's Industry, was uh, awarded uh, a contract for 1,600 of these Jeeps at a walking price of $734. And um, the rest is history. A lot of these were shipped overseas and they were, um, they were used uh, by uh, the Allied forces in places like um, 
Russia and so on and so forth. So this is an era where uh, the World War II was um, setting in and the transportation industry was really becoming uh, a critical element of the war era that we had. Now, as we go past the, the World War II, we find ourselves in an era where our vehicles are starting to go faster. They, have, they are more powerful. We have um, a society and demographic that is more aware of things such as safety. And now we are entering what I call the safety minded era of transportation. And it just so happens that Niels Bowen was an engineer who had worked on one of the, or had invented the self-ejection seat for aircraft. Um, and um, he was drafted by Volvo to um, use his wares to come up with some sort of harnessing device. And he came up with the three, P, uh, three point seat belt that to this day we use in our vehicles with just about minor to no ver uh, variations. Now, since I deal with vehicle safety, I often share with my students that the biggest safety device that I, we have in our vehicles is our seat. It just turns out that God forbid, if you are involved in a rollover accident, if you are able to remain within your vehicle, your likelihood of survival is 90%. If you're ejected, your life likelihood of survival is 10%. And I can't even begin to tell you how many times I hear stories of accidents where a person is not uh, wearing a seatbelt and they have catastrophic uh, outcome. So I will maintain that it is one of the most iconic and important safety devices that we have in our vehicles. And certainly since 1959, where Volvo came out with their seatbelts, we have made a lot of improvements to our seat belts as well as the rest of the safety devices that we have in our vehicles. Now, as we move into the 60s, that's an era where certainly in the US, there was a lot of political turmoil and, and, and the Vietnam War and, and other aspects. And uh, there was a large youth population. Sort of, we are in the middle of the baby boomer generation. And um, there was this young, brash vice president at Ford who worked very closely with Henry Ford himself. And uh, he came up with Ford Mustang. And uh, that was based on another um, sort of an offshoot of the vehicle that, that Ford had at the time. And uh, they did this at a record engineering speed on um, not a whole lot of money. Uh, and as he was quite an ingenious marketeer, he showcased it in 1964 at the World's Fair, and it was an overnight sensation, just like the Beatles were during that era. In fact, they took 22,000 orders during the first 24 hours that that people went up for sale. 
They sold more than a million of these vehicles in 18 months. Amazing. And, you know, anyone who's seen this vehicle up close can attest to the fact that when it's parked and you're looking at it, it has this presence. It sort of like speeds of speed and elegance at the same time. I can share with you a personal story on my way to school as a teenager. I would go by this house that had a car just like that, parked in front. And I would remember that many days I would stop as a 12, 13 year old, and I would be mesmerized by this vehicle, just like its presence. And it was quite something. Um, I didn't quite know what vehicle it was, but I really liked that pony on the front. That was pretty cool, right? And of course, to this day, it's one another one of our uh, engineering, uh, transportation with car icons. We're moving into this era that that uh, performance matters and uh, and uh, look matters. And now, beyond what we have had before, car is becoming a status symbol, where it is being noticed. And then around the same era. Um, we, uh, there was another young, brash lawyer by the name of uh, uh, Rolf Nader, uh, or Ralph Nader, uh, in California, who uh, he uh, made the business that our cars were not safe enough, and he, in a big way, went after the car industry to challenge them to make their cars safer. He published this book called Unsafe at Any Speed, Sold many, many, many copies in 1965. And he, in particular, uh, singled out Chevy uh, Corvier for its lack of safety. And uh, it just turns out that many years later, actually, uh, National Labor Party of Private Safety Administration did a study and they found out that uh, the Corvier was not any let's say that a lot of vehicles are in still. But nonetheless, the damage has been done. And uh, to this day, sort of people think of Corvier as not a very safe car. But the important thing is that that sort of safety culture uh, started permeating in our vehicles. I earlier told you about this um, uh, seat belt as a safety equipment. And it turned out that um, Ralph Nader's uh, book and his pursuit actually pushed away for a lot of the active safety systems that we have in our modern vehicles. For the first time, the auto industry started thinking about, well, I need to do something for as to protecting the occupants after the vehicle has been involved in an accident. And that is what sort of, you know, or uh, before preventing the vehicle from getting into an accident, get better. And that's what the active safety systems are, really. And, and along with that came things like airbags that were invented by Alan Green who had for many years worked uh, in various areas related to um, charge for explosives and that sort of thing. And he thought, well, can I have a device in my vehicle that uh, will use sort of the same charge concept of explosive that we use? and deploys a safety apparatus. Hence, the airbag. An airbag is considered 
as one of our active safety systems because it deploys before the accident. And then um, he was able to successfully um, get uh, some of the car companies, notably GM, to listen to him. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, they um, rolled it out uh, in uh, 1968 in their tornado. Now, bear in mind that this was something that many in the, car, in the automotive industry were entirely against. In fact, the other photo that I made earlier has got a book that is very interesting reading called The Other Photo that came out in early 80s. And there is an entire chapter of that book that he uh, talks about how this is a horrible idea. And as part of that, he kind of uh, mocks the whole idea and says, can you imagine having an explosive device going off uh, less than a foot away from your head so that it can save you? Which at some level is true, right? But nonetheless, it is still an essential safety device. And of course, the vehicles that we drive today don't have one airbag. They've got many side curtains, passenger side, uh, steering, knee, uh, you know, uh, airbag deployment, and so on and so forth. So again, quite interesting. As we turn into 70s, for the first time, we become aware of the fragility of Earth and our sort of dependence on it. So by, until this era, we've been sort of drinking off of a lot of cheap gasoline and cheap oil, and uh, we were using it like it's going out of stock. And all of a sudden, we're coming across places like Calcutta or some other places that the air pollution is so heavy that it is affecting our health. So in early 70s, President Nixon signed the Clean Air Act with a lot of bipartisan support, which of course is something that is unheard of nowadays, right? But nonetheless, uh, it's kind of a normality for, for its time. And that paved the way for a lot of further advancement that came after it, that continues to this day, including a lot of the alternative fuel vehicles that we are talking about. And then around the same time, of course, the space was looming large. We had landed on the moon and uh, we were going back to it. So in 19, oh, along, 1971, along with the Apollo 15 mission, we deployed a <laughs> Mars rover. The first time that we took our transportation to outer space and we allowed the astronauts to drive this. It had a lot of sensors on it and a lot of advanced technologies, certainly suited for space and zero-g gravity and that sort of thing. And one can argue that in many ways it paved the way for a lot of the technological advances that pursued the years after. A good example of how we develop a technology in one area and as we learn more about it, we're able to mass produce it in other areas, such as automobiles and others. The awareness of the environment had started this thinking and this engineering effort in making our vehicles cleaner. That took some time, 
But eventually, in 1997, Toyota was the first company that manufactured a hybrid electric vehicle. Now, you see, we knew how to do it. The concept was familiar. Together with service you, we had done it as late as the end of the 19th century. The challenge was that we did not have a good way of having battery technology that was as good as the rest of the mechanical components that I had in my vehicle. That, by the way, we had taken many, many years, almost a century, to develop. So that was a daunting task. That initially, Toyota was able to capture, and eventually to this day, <laughs> fortunately, thankfully for all of us, it is continuing. And now a lot of our vehicles are either fully electric or hybrid, hydroelectric V. Again, another very critical and seminal development in our transportation industry. Now, as we, as we kind of master this, we started becoming bolder. The electric generation had also permeated the introduction of more sensors and technologies in our vehicles. So then a lot of companies started working on autonomy and self-driving. And uh, in 2008, um, there was a robotic Prius that uh, was operating around San Francisco area. I got a lot of press for delivering a pizza, right? But nonetheless, it managed to grab a lot of attention from consumers like you and me. And mind you, that this is another example of a government investment in a whole series of technologies. In early 2000, DARPA issued a grand challenge. They went to the world and said, we want you to deliver an autonomous vehicle that can drive in the middle of deserts in California. And if you're able to finish that course, we'll give you a million dollars. That got the ball rolling with many companies and, and universities. And uh, no one got in the first go around. But it was a successful winner in the second world. And that sowed the seed for a lot of technologies that has followed, including many that you see in the self driving Prius. And of course, we're sort of at a point where um, we have companies like Tesla, that come along and disrupt the entire automotive industry. And Tesla came up with the first fully electric vehicle. And it was truly a revolution. The reason I call it a revolution is because if you go back in our history, automotive history, you see that the last time we had something close to this was about 100 years before when we went from steam powered cars to fossil fuel powered vehicles. And all of a sudden, we made our complete change of our propulsion system. Now we have something that's entirely electric. So that was pretty cool. And this truly, truly uh, revolutionized the auto industry and our, the future of our transportation. It brought about the push for low emission vehicles that will continue well into the future 
the author in my lifetime and many others. Thankful again. So sort of like I, I passed you through a lot of history very quickly. I highlighted a lot of things. And perhaps some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. Uh, I am here talking about the Model T. That was in your title, if I remember correctly. Well, you are exactly true. I mean, correct. The reason I left it out is because I wanted to give it its own space. I consider the Model T to be one of those iconic things that is first and foremost. Uh, it was a change of scene in transportation. Well, beyond its engineering presence, certainly on the engineering presence, many of you know that it's a car that revolutionized the assembly line, the mass production, and, and all that kind of thing. And certainly, Henry Ford was a marketing genius. But more important than all of those accolades, the thing that it did for us is that it has significant cultural, lifestyle, and social uh, effect. It led to the, to the growth of the suburbs and reaching outside the boundaries of the immediate city and um, allowed us to have a mobility longer distances, uh, promoted the highways and land transportation that we all enjoy today. So it was truly a sea change for its time. And now if I go back to my title again and think about intelligent transportation and if I sort of draw a parallel between what uh, Model T did, and what we have been busy doing in the past two decades, certainly in the past decade, in terms of bringing intelligence and technology to our vehicles, I can draw a very strong parallel between the two. The intelligence that we have in our vehicles today is as revolutionary in terms of its social, cultural, and Overall economic effects as Model T was for its time. And now, because we are some hundred years later, I would submit to you that the effects are going to be even so much grander than Model T was. And you know, the proliferation of sensors and microprocessors that we've had in our vehicles, many that I'm showing on this slide here have enabled us to fundamentally have a different interaction and relationship with our vehicles. We're able, many of our vehicles, the newer productions, are able to navigate and drive themselves and at some levels think for themselves more often better than the human operator. So at one level, it has brought us safer and um, uh, more safety. And at another level, it has, um, it has enabled us to do things that we were not able to do. And um, they're able to sense their environment. They're able to make decisions. And often they're able to do that with even better accuracy than a lot of our humans. Now, some of you may know that we sort of put our vehicles in different levels that are defined by the Society of Automotive Engineers, and it's level one through level five. Level one is a vehicle that doesn't have any intelligence in it. Let's say a vehicle of some 10 years ago, uh, level, uh, I'm sorry, level zero. And level one is, uh, some vehicles that we have that has a lot of vehicles that we have that have got some level of intelligence. Uh, level two allows me to drive my vehicle hands free as long as I'm able to acknowledge that I am still behind the steering wheel. 
And level three is able um, to drive a vehicle without much presence from me. It's able to completely autonomously make a lot of decisions for me. And then level four and five are full autonomy. A lot of our vehicles are at level two, and we even have some that are at level three. If I would project in a short 10 years from now, a lot of our vehicles will be at level three. Just think about it. If I'm able to um, drive my vehicle without having to be constantly attached to the steering wheel, and, and be fatigued by that stress, how much more enjoyable the driving is going to be and how much more freedom it's going to offer me. Now, and as I've been pointing out to, this road to autonomy has been paved over many years. In fact, one can go to the 60s and 50s and trace them back to the first cruise controls that we started having in our vehicles. I certainly talked about the DARPA Great Challenge, uh, Grand Challenge and many other events that have come after. <clears throat> now, I'm coming to the end of my presentation and often I ask, well, is it the technology that's driving the autonomy or is it the autonomy that is driving the technology? Sort of a classical chicken and egg scenario. And frankly, frank, frankly, if you would ask me, my answer to that is I don't know. And perhaps on a good day, I can make an argument on both sides of that. So for a moment, if I assume that it is the vehicle autonomy, a desire to drive our vehicles autonomously is driving the technology development, then of course it makes sense to ask, well, why? Why do we have this kind of zeal for autonomy? And perhaps I can summarize that in one word. Safety. You know, as human beings, we care about our safety. It's fundamental to us, to our being, to our self-preservation. -pres and an autonomous vehicle will be able to provide multi layers that will provide that safety. And again, that is something that we have cared about for many years. Perhaps we can trace our way all the way back to the uh, early parts of the 20th century. And if I take the other side of that argument, that I say, well, it's the technology that's driving the vehicle autonomy, then it still deserves the same question. Why? And we each can come up with a reason for it. For me, the reason is clear. It's, again, our zeal for survival. It's the fact that we're becoming aware that we have been abusing the earth and that is starting to affect us. We need to integrate technologies into our vehicles to develop that will kind of help us with this unsustained trend that we have had with the climate. We are seeing images like this. And it starts to register with us. I have colleagues that probably sort of the hair wrangler that stands up every time to see that slide because they say, well, man, our Earth has been warming up since the day we existed. This is not anything new. It's true. That's certainly true. However, at what rate? And I would submit to you that we are 
accelerating that trend, that warming trend. And it's starting to affect our lifestyle. It is starting to affect us economically. And we are determined that we will change that. I wrote an editorial some 11 years ago for the inaugural issue of Advances in Automotive or Automobile Engineering, one of the journals. And within that, I sort of put forward a few thoughts. And one of the thoughts that I put forward was that I'm really excited about the future of our vehicles and what is going to come about because of the exciting technologies that we are working in our lab. I had a chance to see some of your labs earlier today, and it's really exciting to see the things that we are doing with 3D printing and middle deposit technologies and many others. And as I reflect back on these sort of technologies and project Unto the future, I see a real bright, bright future for both transportation and in general humanity. And it's quite heartwarming. I want to thank you for sharing this afternoon with me. I want to thank you again for inviting me to give this lecture. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I will be around to answer any questions you may have or carry on with more dialogue. And I realize some of the stuff that I put in front of you were a bit thought-provoking, and that is by design. I hope that we can generate a dialogue that we can bring our different way of thinking to a resolution or some sort of consensus or some sort of better understanding of each other, which at a social level often have been somewhat more and more missing in our daily discourse. Once again, thank you.
uh, reason to come to level both on the sensory side, um, electrical, mechanical, and civil engineering side, to be able to bring it together and learn it. And find on that point, the biggest hindrance to the practical implementation of legal autonomy is not our ability to integrate sensors into our vehicles or having a sensor sensing their environment, but it is the ability of that vehicle to integrate into the environment in a seamless fashion. And that integration requires a large amount of sensory and rethinking of our conventional infrastructure that is currently on the wrong. Uh, we have <coughs> smart cities in places like Chicago, Michigan, in Columbus, Ohio, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and so on and so forth, where the whole emphasis is on how I can take the existing infrastructure, some of the cities that have existed for years and years and and and, uh, and uh, perhaps in some cases that close to centuries more, and and make it smart, make it tough with the vehicles that are um, uh, that way. Excellent question. Yes, and we got we got to bring we got to bring that in case uh, we got to bring that down in big I get it. Where the technology is improving every month, year. And eventually, it's going to be that you'll have driverless cars. There'll be an accident here, an accident there. Do you think the American public will buy into this, given the cost and the drawbacks and the advantages? So I'll talk to American, uh, not global, but the American public will buy into getting an autonomous vehicle. The uh, quick answer to that, from my perspective, is yes. And let me, uh, let me uh, share with you why I believe. Uh, ultimately, if you look at our demographic, we have an aging demographic. And it comes with that aging demographic challenge, it was saying, with driving. If I'm driving at night, and if I get um, headlights that are able to adjust to the ambient and, and uh, change the pollution from high to low and vice versa, or are able to change their orientation so that I can see better as I'm going around the curve, right? That I just ease my ability to navigate on the road, right? And, uh, and therefore, it's, again, it all comes down to me in terms of our interaction with our vehicles and how stress and driving is going to place on you. So I just enable a person that is more advanced in age and uh, naturally has got um, sort of a longer, uh, a, a slower track than what I can find. Uh, perhaps a lower night vision, and others to be able to safely and successfully operate the vehicle, right? And now I can sort of like elaborate on that and kind of um, take, extend on it and say, well, if I'm able to do the same thing in terms of my ability to, uh, to preemptively apply my brakes, if I'm about to be involved in an accident, so if I am in a thick fog and I've got my automated emergency braking capability, then that um, uh, solar sensor and the light sensor that I have in the vehicle is able to see a lot further beyond what I could see with my eyes in the fog. They are able to preemptively apply the brakes or charge the brakes or both well before my reaction time allows me to go from gas pedal to brake pedal. 
right? And of course, with aging, all of that kind of things. Now, I pick on people like me because often we are more set in our paradigms and we are more resistant to change. I look at many of this room, and they are the younger generations. They grew up with technology, and they are very quick to adapt to it. In fact, they very much embrace and enjoy it. To them, it's not so much the reaction time and the ability to see around the corner. To them, it's the cool fact. Third, these things are about our food. So they are sort of the low kernel clear. People like me are the higher level clear. And if the industry people get involved with people like us, then we're getting yeah. But it's, it is it all depends on the shift in paradigm. Uh, when we came out with by the way, when we came out with CPEC, in my generation, I remember people would cut out their seatbelts, would say, you yeah, would say, oh, I said, buddy, this is a strangling device, right? And then when we came up with uh, uh, ABS, people would take delivery of a new vehicle and would take it to the, to the killer and would disable the ABS. Anyhow, it takes 10 minutes. It's great. I tell you, that was very good time. Thank you. What do you think about flying cars? Air will be like this as well, right? I must have paid them. <laughs> I did it. I knew that at least one of you guys is going to ask that question. Wow, that's that's an awesome, awesome question that certainly deserves uh, discussing over a couple of drinks. <laughs> But a quick answer to your question is yes. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, our thinking has been two generational when it comes to transportation. But how about using the third dimension? Right? When I talk to my physicist friends, they talk about four dimensions. Now, I have to think about that one a little bit, right? But for now, as a mechanical engineer, let me think about three. I, I often think of them important, but nonetheless, if I think about three dimensions, then I freed myself from the roadway. Now, interestingly enough, in early days, our imagination was the limiting factor, and we were so stuck in our vehicles that I would take a vehicle and I would merge it, kind of weld it together with an airplane, and I would say, oh, I'm going to right? And uh, of course, that would be it. But we've always had this fascination with flying. And when I look around, such as some of the concept pictures that I'm showing, then you see these vehicles that are a lot more futuristic, they've got phenomenal aerodynamics, they have amazing road worthiness, and they have the ability to fly in low altitudes. You know, this sort of um, co-op concept that I have is sort of a lot of our drones on steroids, right? And it's a big version of that. And Honda is one of the companies that is in the leading edge of flying cars. In fact, uh, they may have flying cars as we speak that they are trying to get out. Now, as long as you promise that to hold me to my predictions, right? My best estimate is that in as little as 10 years from now, flying cars is going to be reality. And perhaps we are thinking, oh, that's possible. The FAA is not going to let it happen. Yeah, but we're also not 
things that we thought was impossibility and uh, have happened, right? And uh, but it's actually why cars are going to hit us with a vengeance. And the reason for that is the roadway infrastructure has uh, become the bottleneck and the limiting factor in our uh, mobility. I cannot build roadways fast enough. I live near Washington, D.C., and uh, there's a stretch of I-66 near there that they took from four lanes into seven lanes. And I thought, ah, it's going to take forever before we uh, build, build this one. Guess what? It's already congested. If you go in the morning, you're going to run out of time into the division town, and if you come out of town in the afternoons, um, you, you know, you, uh, you are going to do stuff. I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in the DC area, and he and his wife, they leave their house at 5.30 in the morning for a 75-minute commute into the city for the work. And I said, 5.30 in the morning. He said, yeah. If I leave at 7 o'clock, I'm not going to get to work until 10.30. Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's unsustainable. And therefore, we have to think of a of it. Excellent question. And uh, you'll get an extra cup of coffee and uh, <laughs> for that. <laughs> Jesus behind out of the box question. Nuclear. We have a lot of advantages in nuclear medicine. Are there any forward thinking that maybe a hundred years from now we will have nuclear energy production? Amazing question. It's not, it's not, um, it, is, it is, it's one of my absolute most favorite topics. So, uh, some uh, 40 years ago, when I was in grad school, uh, we uh, now I'm talking to graduate students in the, in the room now. Uh, we used to get together uh, on um, Friday afternoon for a pizza kind of social. And then, as the president of the group, I said, well, you know, guys, we're all researchers. So why don't we get together and sort of exchange ideas in terms of sort of things that we can check in the future, right? And then, and then uh, during one of the sessions, I put forward that, but what about having cars that doesn't need fuel? As I started at the beginning of my year. Oh, and the rule of quiet side. How many pieces of pizza do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the gist of that idea was exactly this that we could have cars that um, would have an embedded nuclear cell in it that will last the life, the useful life of that vehicle, and eventually it's recycled. And uh, for safety, and also um, put it back into the circulation. And I believe that if I come back in 50 years from now, what I just presented to you is not really going to be a far fetched idea. In fact, I know for a fact, without admitting it, some of the government laboratories, like Oak Ridge, are working. And that's exact concept. This whole idea of a mini nuclear cell for powering our homes, for powering our vehicles, and you know, it's an option and a derivative of what we have been putting in space. And what is it?
putting in some of our nuclear stuff. So it's, we have managed to miniaturize this ability to generate nuclear or generate power from nuclear fusion into packages that are manageable, safe, self-contained, yada, yada, yada. And uh, that is going to proliferate into beyond its current military applications, mostly or space applications, into civilian applications. I am supercharged and super optimistic, no pun intended, on that one. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It was really great and it was very informative too. You talked about the different conditions that we had because of global work. One thing that we had this year, we had a lot of smoking conditions up on us like New York City where the wildfire. You could not see anything way at times. So, is there anything in the automated vehicle that's being done to like address more vehicles to kind of navigate those conditions? Because for the future, if you have automated vehicles that like you know, put the fire yourself, they can like navigate it. I'm just curious about that part. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate your comment and excellent and question. Uh, and the quick answer is by the pursuit your question correctly, as far as being able to see. Uh, in smoke and fog and that sort of thing, our vehicles, even today's vehicles, modern vehicles, are already equipped with that sort of thing. Uh, and then, to what extent I'm able to deploy them uh, in that environment in an autonomous fashion or, uh, or in uh, otherwise, or that is able to help with putting out the fire or mitigating the fire or that sort of thing. Uh, that is certainly uh, something that is possible, uh, of course, with the proper honoring of the vehicle and so on. Excellent question. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we'll move uh, to the next phase of the conversation, Karen's in Brady Center. And you're all welcome to attend for dessert and conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Very meaningful to me. <laughs> I grew up in a home for no one broke. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, my goal in life at least is fun.